This is the uh, Battle Brief on Turning Points, the American Revolution. I'm John Moss. I am on the staff of the National Museum in our programs and education department. And I'm joined tonight by my silent partner, Kenna Felix, who's our producer. And so she is uh, helping us tonight. So thanks to Kenna for that. And thanks to all of you who are joining this evening. I uh, hope you are, all are interested in Revolutionary War turning points. Uh, these are turning points that uh, I have identified as such. Uh, the five key military related turning points of the Revolutionary War. They, I will explain what I mean by those, the term turning points. And I will also be um, tell, discussing at the end uh, what makes certain conflicts or campaigns or battles not turning points. We're not going to be getting into detail about uh, the the uh, the events of every every one of the five campaigns, the uh, nitty gritty on the battles or the uh, the campaigns, the operations. We just don't have time to do that. But uh, I would uh, we are going to talk about them in general, and then after each one, uh, I'm going to uh, give my presentation on why I think they are the turning points of the revolution. And at the end, again, we'll talk later about why certain battles, while important or even bloody or, or devastating uh, to one side or the other, or weren't necessarily what I would consider turning points. So why don't we go ahead to the first or the next slide and we'll start to talk about uh, some key definitions. And I guess I'd start it out by saying, what is a turning point. So we can we can ask that question uh, by saying what is our definition of a turning point from a military standpoint. And with that, as you can see here, the definition that I use is a battle or a campaign that led to a significantly different course of subsequent events. And you could also say a military event, meaning a battle or a campaign or some other event related to the, the armies of the revolution that caused decisive change. Not just that they were bloody or not just that they were large, um, but ones that changed the trajectory of the war or made victory more certain. So we'll start in on those. Uh, if we can have the next slide, please. We'll start in on those by uh, talking about the first one on my list of the five events, which was the battle of the battles of Trenton and Princeton. And the battles of these two battles, and actually three battles, because there's effectively a second battle of Trenton during this time period, uh, started in the, um, uh, started on December 26th, 1776, uh, when, so in, in December of 1776, December 26, Washington attacked Trenton, and 10 days later, uh, there was a campaign for 10 days. These are often referred to as the, the 10 uh, crucial days, and defeated a Hessian element at Princeton, and we'll go to the next slide. And then when, when pressed by the British at Lord Corn, of Lord Cornwallis, uh, defeated a, a detachment of redcoats, at Princeton in January 3rd, 1777. So you can see from the top right of the map there all the way to the bottom left was the, the seat of war, so to speak, related to this from the fall of New York, uh, from when Washington began his march across New Jersey to leave New York, pursued by the British, and eventually crossed the uh, the river to get the Delaware River to get to uh, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. The um, uh, British uh, were were very um, uh, optimistic of the success in driving Washington away and and defeating him uh, at the battles of Long Island and uh, Fort Washington, the fact the capture of Fort Washington, the evacuation of Fort Lee in New Jersey. And again, Washington finally retreats to at the bottom of our screen, where you can see uh, he was at the uh, on the Pennsylvania side of the of the uh, Delaware River. 
Washington crosses the Delaware River in, in the famous uh, episode that everybody's seen the paintings um, that he crossed the river, attacked the Hessians at Trenton. It was an isolated outpost in a string of outposts uh, all across central and northern New Jersey, uh, defeated the Hessians there. And in two other actions, again at, Tre at, at Trenton and uh, finally at the uh, Battle of Princeton in 1777, January 3rd, 1777, Washington defeated them as well. So two, arguably three, but two significant victories, Trenton and Princeton. Uh, we'll go to our next slide and see a little bit more detail. Uh, this is a winter campaign. Washington was really uh, at the end of his tether in many ways. Um, uh, this is a map showing Washington's crossing and then the approach to Trenton with the uh, blue arrows and defeating uh, the, the force there under Colonel Rawl and forcing him to surrender almost all the troops there. Washington went back across the river after that, fearful of the British, but was able to make a second crossing and work his way up to Princeton, which we'll see in the next slide, where he defeated a very um, powerful British force that opposed him. Um, and you can see how he worked his way up to the east of the British under Lord Cornwallis, who we would face later on, as many of you know. Um, so this was, and after Princeton, uh, Washington toyed again with more offensive operations, but because of the fact that many of his men, their enlistments had already expired, food was scarce, uh, logistics were difficult in the winter, he opted to uh, avoid any further action uh, in, in the winter uh, of 1777 here uh, and, and decided against that. So if we'll go to the next slide, and here's where we can discuss why Trenton was a turning point. So what we have here is the Battle of Trenton and Princeton uh, established the American army as a symbol of the American cause. Uh, a lot of Americans had soured on the success of the revolution, especially after Washington was forced out of uh, New York City. Uh, the uh, British had much success in driving him anywhere they wanted to, uh, to push him. And it was considered to be a very low point. Uh, you can see his quote at the bottom in, uh, in December 1776, even before Trenton. It also showed to the world, but mainly to the American cause, uh, that, the, that Washington was capable of success, that all of the battles that, and skirmishes and maneuvers that he, he lost on Long Island and the New York City area, pushed across New Jersey, he was able to uh, reconstitute his force, uh, uh, increase morale, get them to go on a winter mission in a very bad storm in December and defeat British and Hessian forces. So that was a, a very big morale booster for not only uh, Washington and the army, but the public and other European entities watching what was going on in the war in America, particularly France. Uh, it demonstrated that the army could win offensive operations, not just uh, defensive uh, operations behind breastworks or fortifications and, and to uh, be able to uh, de uh, defend positions such as uh, the first two uh, attacks that the British made on Bunker Hill in 1775. So it also helped with recruitment in the spring. Uh, all of a sudden, New Jersey wasn't uh, lost to the British and uh, many New Jerseyans came out and uh, with their militia units or enlisted in regiments that were be trying to be raised in that area. But also after Trenton and Princeton, uh, Washington was able to really adopt what became his Fabian strategy, which is to make small blows against the enemy, to make, uh, make sure his army was rarely caught in the open field uh, against a very well-trained, very well-supplied, experienced British army. And that's pretty much what he adopted for the rest of the war, with a few exceptions. Uh, he did go on the offensive later on in 1777 near Philadelphia at uh, Germantown, and he also committed to a major battle um, in, in 1777 at Brandywine. 
but for the most part, he aimed to keep keep the British bottled up either in New York or Philadelphia, avoid being uh, defeated in the field, occupying uh, mountainous or high ground to, for winter quarters, so that he never uh, always had an option of moving to a, a different position. <laughs> so that that in itself, the the adoption of the strategy, the new morale, and the demonstration that the Americans could win in the field, uh, military successes in battle uh, was, was a major, major turning point, as I mentioned. So let's go on to the next one. And the next uh, turning point we're gonna talk about was the Saratoga campaign of 1777. Uh, this was a, the major campaign that was uh, launched by the British and I'll see if I have another slide here. Uh, in 1777, it was, it was coordinated by uh, British officials in London, uh, Canada, New York City. And as we see when we bring up the next slide, uh, this, was a, this was a campaign over a wide, wide swath of, uh, of New York State and the Adirondack Mountains. And in essence, what, what we have is a campaign that had that had two prongs initially. The first you can see under Burgoyne, which came down from the south, from the north in Canada, uh, Montreal and Saint John's, uh, in in the summer. And the idea was to move south along Lake Champlain with a large force of loyalists, redcoats, and Hessians. Uh, used Lake Champlain and Lake George as highways for logistical uh, transportation because this once 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 Montreal was was uh, behind them and to a little extent St. John's, there were no major visit villages or towns or logistical centers that Burgoyne could really rely on until he got to Albany, which was his objective. And so he was going to uh, push any American forces out of the way, capture the key American position at Fort Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain where the waters from Lake George come into it. A secondary operation was planned and was executed uh, coming from the West. And that, as you can see by uh, uh, Barry St. Ledger, who would come from Fort Oswego on Lake Ontario and move to coordinate with Burgoyne's southern thrust down from Canada. So St. Ledger would also have the added effect of drawing off a lot of militia in upstate New York uh, who, who were expected to go against Burgoyne. But with this threat coming from St. Ledger from the west down the Mohawk River toward Albany, that was going to be a major diversion of resources for the Americans, which would, which would the British hoped, um, be able to drive them out of Albany, and the goal here was to drive a wedge between the New England colonies, now states, from the rest of the American states, because if the British were able to occupy Ticonderoga and Lake George and Albany, uh, the uh, West Point, New York, and New York City they would effectively prevent the two parts of the colonies from interacting and having a cohesive defense. Now, the big problem here was, as many of you know, especially if you attended our book talk about a year ago, where uh, Kevin Weddle from the US Army War College talked about his new book on the Saratoga campaign, uh, the British commander of this expedition, Burgoyne, uh, he had numerous logistical difficulties, never really had enough horses or wagons to, to move supplies, uh, assist the wounded, uh, and also his uh, Native American allies were very unreliable. He had a very difficult time uh, controlling them. But even more so, there was, which we can't really get into the details uh, uh, tonight because of our time and because of the scope of the uh, program, but the communication problem between Lord Germain, who was Secretary of State for the Southern Colonies, in, in other words, the minister who was mostly responsible for the war, 
uh, how in New York and Burgoyne in Canada was very, very significant, very difficult to communicate. The time lag between letters going back and forth would often uh, be, be irrelevant by the time they arrived on the scene. But suffice it to say that Germain and Burgoyne expected General Howe with the main British army in New York initially to cooperate with Burgoyne by moving northward from New York, New York City. Well, in this cross of all these letters going back, Howe actually suggested several different plans. And the one he finally settled on was to take his army uh, uh, south of New York City and attack Philadelphia after landing in the Delaware Bay. And he thought he had time to be able to do that uh, in time and still be able to assist Burgoyne coming down this Champlain Valley corridor. Well, things did not go that way at all. What happened, as, as we will see, is that the um, uh, Burgoyne started out on his, his operations, as did St. Ledger, but Howe was delayed leaving New York City, and he, he really did not leave until July. Um, he did not want to go into the Delaware Bay after he was, he was warned by a British ship that the defenses around Philadelphia were too strong. So he further delayed by going around up the Chesapeake Bay and landing in the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland at a place called Head of Elk. So um, let's go to the next screen here. The um, British ran into trouble at Saratoga, not that far from Albany, uh, just north of Albany. They were unable to get to Albany. The American forces under General Gates were successful in bringing supplies and troops and combat leaders such as Benedict Arnold to the um, to the Saratoga area, where in September and October, September 19th and October 7th, and if we could have the next slide, uh, we'll talk about these uh, important points. The, um, the British uh, taught, uh, British and the Americans uh, fought each other. The Hessians were of course supporting the British, but the Americans managed to uh, uh, mobilize a very large and capable militia force ju just at the right time. And at the two battles, one called Freeman's Farm in September and Bemis Heights in October, Burgoyne was forced to surrender on October 17, 1777. He uh, suffered many casualties during the campaign. Um, he alienated his Indian allies, uh, but the um, he was forced to surrender with very aggressive tactics by Benedict Arnold, uh, Daniel Morgan, and some of the other American leaders. So Howe never made it to uh, New York, uh, never helped Burgoyne's uh, campaign. And in fact, um, he, uh, Burgoyne's subordinate in New York City, Sir Henry Clinton, did make an effort at the, at the very last minute to try to uh, rescue Burgoyne and draw off American forces in front of Burgoyne, but it did not prevent the surrender. Uh, Burgoyne had to surrender. And there were very, very significant recriminations on who was at fault on the British side for this, uh, either Germain in London, uh, Burgoyne, Howe, or, um, the commander in Canada, Sir Guy, called uh, Sir Guy Carleton. Um, but the bottom line is the, the, it was a tremendous American victory. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about why this was a significant turning point. So I'm gonna answer my question in the affirmative. The capture of Burgoyne's entire army was a disaster for the British cause. They lost thousands of men and, and British redcoats and even camp followers, officers, officers' wives were all captured, Hessians. 
Uh, and it really, really showed not only that the threat from the northern colonies was now eliminated uh, from, from Canada, the threat to the northern uh, New England and, and um, New York, uh, but it, it took away uh, many soldiers, uh, well-trained, well-equipped soldiers that were difficult to replace uh, 3,000 miles away. Uh, the, main, the main benefit, though, was the official recognition of France uh, of the Americans. Now, this was not the beginning of French assistance, uh, and it wasn't the beginning of Spanish as assistance to the Americans via the French. The French would come to ally themselves with the Americans in 1778. The Spanish did not have a treaty with the Americans, but they did support them by way of, of France and unofficial or, or, or there, was no, there was no treaty with, uh, with the new United States the way the French did. Uh, if you'd like to read more about that, there's a wonderful book called uh, Brothers at Arms by Larry Fierro, who is a, a military historian for the Army at Fort Belvoir, uh, was a Pulitzer finest, a finalist. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's very good. Um, however, uh, the French recognition of American independence, uh, now they were getting more overt uh, money, troops, uh, eventually, weapons, supplies. Um, and the Americans proved themselves again by, by an overwhelming victory that they were capable of victory. Now, one other, one other uh, important point to make about the victory at Saratoga was that once <coughs> France was involved, next slide please, and the Spanish, It refocused the war to the West Indies in 1778. Uh, the British and the French knew that their West Indies sugar islands were very, very valuable and they could not wage war without them and they did not want to have a peace where they lost any of them. So right away after Saratoga and after French recognition of the American cause and the American military effort, the French really uh, quickly decided that they were going to have to, um, excuse me, the British decided they were going to have to, di to divert a lot of their resources as far as uh, naval assets, uh, troops, and uh, logistical supplies to the West Indies for the defense of those islands. And so uh, the, the heyday of the British involvement as far as uh, Royal Navy, numbers of troops involved was really uh, the period uh, between the Battle of Long Island and in, in, in uh, 1776, um, uh, the summer of 76, through uh, the end of the Saratoga campaign. The British would never have as many troops, uh, including Hessians, as they did then. And once France came on board with the Americans, that really sealed any further. Uh, there were some reinforcements at various points between 1778 and 1781, uh, but nothing near as much as, as they had had during the earlier battles. So let's move on to our third um, turning point. And this isn't a battle or a campaign, but it is a military event, so I'm going with it. Uh, this is the Valley Forge winter of 1777 and 1778. And uh, what I want to really stress is the why, and it was important. Um, after the battles of Brandywine in September 1777, that's in Pennsylvania, and Germantown, October 4th, 1777, also near Philadelphia, uh, the British secured that city, which was regarded as the American capital. Congress had to flee. And uh, Washington was, was defeated uh, at, uh, at Brandywine. Uh, you could argue on, in, in Germantown that Washington kind of beat himself at that battle due to an overly complicated uh, tactical plan. 
but uh, the British were now in, in possession of Philadelphia. They could be resupplied there eventually when several forts on the Delaware River were reduced. But Washington realized that he needed to occupy a place for winter quarters that was not too far away from Philadelphia so they could keep an eye on what the British were doing, but also defensible enough and far enough away, especially in the winter where the British would not uh, likely attack them. And they picked Valley Forge, which is west of Philadelphia. So next slide, please. Um, some modern images of the uh, Valley Forge encampment, obviously not in the wintertime here, but um, it was an area of, of relatively flat ground with rolling hills near the river, um, uh, not too far distant from the city of Philadelphia, which the British wound up occupying from the uh, fall of 1777 through the time they evacuated in June of 1778. So let's get the next slide, please. And let me go over a couple of basics about the, uh, about the Valley Forge experience. As many of you know, uh, who have visited there uh, or have read about the revolution, the, um, the, main, uh, the main gist of, of the whole of the story of that winter was that uh, it was very difficult. Uh, it was cold, snowy, not the worst winter that would come later at Morristown, New Jersey. But uh, a foreign officer by the name of Baron von Steuben, or at least that's what he called himself, that rank of Baron, but had experience in the Prussian army, uh, was able to drill and instruct the American army in how to be a European army. And let's go to the next slide. So why was that important? Why did, why did Washington want a European army? Well, he knew that the only way he was going to be able to defeat the British in the field in battle was to have a well-drilled European style army that could trade volleys blow by blow against the British and defeat them in the field and convince them to end the war. A guerrilla war or a partisan war as it was often called then, <coughs> excuse me, would not be enough to force the British to leave. And Washington and many of his generals knew that, that to attack isolated outposts here and there, burn some wagons of supplies meant for the British, that would be annoying, but it wouldn't be able to, it would, they would not be able to defeat the British in a battle uh, that would convince them to end the war or, or enter into some kind of negotiated peace. So Washington and his uh, 11,000 troops um, came to Valley Forge where they endured many, many hardships as most of us know. And as I'll talk about in the next slide, please, uh, this is why Valley Forge was a turning point. Uh, von Steuben's success was obvious the next year, especially at the late June Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in New Jersey which was the first really set piece battle that Washington's army fought against the British um, since Brandywine for sure, but it was the first one that they were able to show that they knew how to move in formation. They knew how to move from column into line. They, they learned how to refuse a flank, all these type of military maneuvers on the battlefield that were necessary to maintain the field and pour volley after volley into the enemy. Also during this period of time, there was an incident called the Conway Cabal, which was a movement by certain officers to depose Washington as the um, uh, uh, commander in chief of the Continental Army. That was diffused by Washington and his subordinates. Um, if you'd like more information on that, there's a fabulous book that came out several years ago called The Conway Cabal by Mark Lender. Uh, it's a wonderful book and uh, it goes into a lot of the detail, but it, it, it established Washington as the commander. And after that, he never, there was never really much doubt that he would be 
uh, the guy who was going to be <laughs> the commander in chief of the Continental Army. Um, now, it also showed the French officers, many of whom were volunteers with Washington at this time, uh, including Lafayette, um, du Duportel, and others, that uh, the, the Americans had, had an army that they could use and move and fight and not get defeated. Um, also during this period, and I think this probably really isn't stressed enough, is that Washington at, 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 at one point after the first of the year, uh, he invited a, a congressional, a Continental Congress committee uh, of members of that Congress to come to Valley Forge. They, were, they had been meeting at York, Pennsylvania, having been uh, deposed from Philadelphia by these military matters. Um, he invited them to work together, see what it looked like, and figure out a way to get his men better supplied uh, and better provided for. And that was, it, it, things did gradually improve uh, for the soldiers, even though over, over 2,000 of them actually uh, died during that winter of malnutrition and disease and, and, and the cold. Uh, but it, it did really confirm this civil military relationship that Washington had and Washington respected, uh, as he did later at the at uh, at Newburgh in uh, the latter part of the war. But this was an important moment uh, for American military history, but also civil military relations, and and uh, and it should be noticed. And again, as I said, it led to a better army at the Battle of uh, Monmouth Courthouse. Uh, that was a direct result of Valley Forge. All those things that Washington's. Um, Washington's strength in position as commander, uh, securing French support, uh, and his work with Congress as well, to, to say nothing of the military pr prowess that was demonstrated in Monmouth. So let's move on to our next uh, turning point. So the war focused significantly after Monmouth Courthouse and 17, late 1778, 1779, in the beginning two operations in the South. Um, and this was mostly under the direction first of Sir Henry Clinton and his subordinate, uh, Lord Charles Cornwallis, who was a Lieutenant General by the time of, the, of uh, the end of the war. And of these battles, there is no question that the most important and the most decisive was Guilford Courthouse, which is in central North Carolina uh, near the modern town of Greensboro. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And we'll talk about this battle. Uh, these are the two protagonists here. Uh, the first one on your left, that's the American Major General Nathaniel Green, probably one of Washington's finest subordinates, uh, had been with the Army through most of its major engagements, including the Boston Campaign, uh, he was not at Saratoga, nor was Washington, but he, he was uh, at Trenton uh, during those the 10 crucial days, uh, Brandywine, um, um, Germantown, Monmouth Courthouse. Uh, he was a Rhode Islander, a former Quaker, and uh, served in um, the, the uh, Southern Theater beginning in, in, uh, in late 1780. Um, on the right is uh, a pre-war image uh, of Lord Cornwallis, who um, was the British commander at many of the, uh, of the major battles in the South that we've all heard of, Camden, Guilford Courthouse. Uh, he, fought, he was at uh, uh, Yorktown, of course, but also had a key role during the Charleston campaign of 1780. So let's move on here and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the American situation so these key dates here, I don't want you to memorize, but uh, if you would, just kind of uh, follow along with me here. The Battle of Cam, first of all, the British successfully captured Charleston, South Carolina in a major amphibious joint operations between the British Army and the Royal Navy. And it, it resulted in the loss of over 5,000 troops for the Americans, uh, dozens and dozens of cannons and equipment. 
and it was a, it was a very tough blow for the American cause. So Cornwallis uh, and uh, Clinton, who was a, who was in charge of it, they forced the surrender of Charleston in May of 1780. In June of 1780, uh, Sir Henry Clinton leaves and goes back to his headquarters with several thousand troops to New York City. But he leaves Cornwallis in command to um, start to consolidate the British victory at Charleston by establishing posts all over South Carolina, particularly a backcountry, and subduing that colony and, and bringing it back to the British cause. And as you may know, the British really expected thousands and thousands of loyalists, people who are loyal to the British cause, to join them uh, in their campaign to take back the state, uh, to put the patriots or Whigs as they call them in their place, make them sign loyalty oaths. And once that was done in South Carolina, the, the British could move into North Carolina. So at the Battle of Camden, South Carolina, it was a British victory in August of 1780, followed by an American victory about six weeks later at Kings Mountain, South Carolina. Now, shortly thereafter, two months later, General Greene took command of what was left of the American army after Camden, and um, he replaced General Gates, who, as you remember, he had been uh, the victor at Saratoga, but when he was sent to command the Southern Department in 1780, he was the, uh, the loser of the Battle of Camden and was replaced by Greene, who was Washington's choice for that position. So Green uh, took command in Charlotte in December 1780. Meanwhile, Cornwallis regrouped, uh, was getting reinforcements uh, from the Chesapeake Bay area and, and moved north to attack the Americans in the Charlotte area and to conquer North Carolina, to wipe out the supplies and bring North Carolina into the British fold again. A detachment of his was defeated and annihilated at Cowpen, South Carolina in uh, January of 17, January 17, 1781. Uh, however, Cornwallis did not allow this to uh, knock his campaign off the rails and he chased Green across North Carolina, eventually pushed Green into Virginia and Cornwallis then became, began an effort to try to get loyalists in central North Carolina to join the cause. That resulted eventually in the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in, Jan in uh, March 15th, 1781. What happened after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse? Cornwallis retreated to the Atlantic at the port city of Wilmington to refit and ended his campaign to conquer North Carolina. So, in that regard, we can see with this timeline that uh, after the after the Cornwallis's victory at Camden, he advanced into North Carolina. In Corn, when he was uh, when a, a small American detach a British detachment was wiped out at Kings Mountain, he delayed his advance, but but still continued two months later into uh, North Carolina despite being having another element of his command defeated at Cowpens. After Cowpens, Cornwallis did not retreat. He continued to chase the Americans and moved into North Carolina with his objective to subdue that state. And the battle that, that caused him to leave North Carolina and fail to occupy or subdue the state was Guilford Courthouse. And that is what we call a turning point. That was a significant victory for the Americans, not tactically, because I'll show you in a second, the British actually were the winners of the battle, um, but the overall strategic situation altered the trajectory of the war in the South and forced Cornwallis out of North Carolina. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's what I mean on the map here uh, from that list I just showed you. You can see in the bottom right, there's Camden. Cornwallis won the Battle of Camden and quickly advanced into the Charlotte area. He withdrew from North Carolina where it says Charlottetown. You can see the down arrow right near Kings Mountain because part of his army had been wiped out. Sickness 
uh, afflicted many of the troops, and he decided to spend uh, about 60 days in the area of Winsboro, which is down at the bottom of the map where that dot is. Once he was ready to go again in January, he advanced uh, east of, uh, west of Kings Mountain uh, toward uh, the Catawba River. And on the left side of the map, you can see the green arrow. That's Tarleton and his cavalry attacking Daniel Morgan's American force, but being defeated and wiped out. But Cornwallis still continued into North Carolina, even though he had suffered that defeat. His, his element under Tarleton had suffered that defeat. So let's move on. This shows you a, a general map. You can see Kings Mountain and Cowpens on the lower left. And the army circulated, uh, Green's army and Cornwallis's army uh, maneuvered in February and mid-March in the area between Salisbury and Hillsborough and up to that dotted line that you can see up at the top of your map, that's the Virginia border. And so they finally met up, next slide please, at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse near uh, Greensboro. Uh, we can't really get into the tactical aspects, but the British were able to attack the Americans in a defensive position. And eventually after a hard fought battle where the uh, Virginians and the Continentals of Green's force did very well, Eventually, Green withdrew because he sensed that his uh, force was starting to give way and he did not want to have his army routed. And so he left the field, retreated to a point about 12 miles away. And at that point, Cornwallis waited about two days and realized he had suffered too many casualties, was too far away from his resupply. He had no prospect of getting reinforcements in the near future. And so he ended his campaign to take North Carolina by marching down the deep and then the Cape Fear rivers to Wilmington. So next slide, please. So was Guilford Courthouse a turning point? Yes, Cornwallis's objective was to invade and conquer North Carolina. And again, I, I won't go through this list again. You can read this while I'm talking, but the key points are his goal was to move to North Carolina and conquer that state. The British defeated Cowpens did not stop his invasion. The British won a Pyrrhic victory at Guilford Courthouse, which led to his retreat at Wilmington. It ended his campaign. And eventually, Cornwallis would move into Virginia in late April and, and wind up at a place called Yorktown, uh, which we will talk about in a few minutes. But North Carolina was not conquered, and Green was actually able to move back into South Carolina by September of 1781. So in, in that way, uh, this was really, Guilford Courthouse was really the turning point, not, not Camden, not Cowpens. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, the Siege of Yorktown, September, October 1781, although uh, it should be borne in mind that the planning of this campaign and the naval maneuvers all originated long before Washington and Rochambeau, the French commander, showed up to besiege uh, uh, Cornwallis in Yorktown. So just please keep that in mind. So uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. So very quickly, I'm not gonna explain much of this map here, but um, uh, basically Washington and Rochambeau, who commanded uh, the French infantry and artillery uh, in the in Connecticut and the and, and Rhode Island, they uh, those the, those two commanders worked to try to coordinate a joint attack between the French and the Americans with French naval support. French naval support was the key of this campaign. And again, glossing over a lot of detail, Washington and Rochambeau found that they were going to have significant French uh, naval support on the American coast in the late summer into the fall, although the French uh, admirals were very clear that they did not want to stay in American waters very long at all because of the threats of hurricanes. But again, to summarize, Washington and Rochambeau moved their troops down through New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. Part of the troops went overland 
through Virginia. Uh, others went by water in the Chesapeake. And they were able to besiege Cornwallis at the port town of Yorktown. Cornwallis had moved from Wilmington, North Carolina in the, the end of April, 1781. He got to Virginia in May of 1781. He had a brief maneuvering campaign with Lafayette between Richmond and Charlottesville in Virginia. And finally, on his way back to the coast to get support from the British base at Portsmouth, he was ordered by Clinton to find a suitable location for a British military base that would be able to be easily resupplied and offer a great port and shelter for British uh, naval assets for the Royal Navy. Well, the event that took place from a naval perspective was the Battle of the Capes, in which the French were able to secure the mouth of the Chesapeake and prevented the British from entering the Chesapeake and rescuing Cornwallis or resupplying him in what was called the Battle of the Capes, September 5th, 1781. It was a French naval victory. And you can see that uh, if you look uh, on the map there where it says Portsmouth on the bottom center, just above that uh, is, is uh, the Battle of the Capes where you see that uh, orange blast. Okay, so Cornwallis gets holed up in Yorktown, besieged by American and French troops, bottled up in the Chesapeake by the French Navy. Next slide, please. So the siege of Yorktown had American and French forces, about 20,000, including Virginia militia um, and the British and Hessian forces by this time, and, and some loyalist elements. Uh, the British uh, command under Cornwallis at Yorktown on the York River in Virginia was uh, was about nine thousand, and we mentioned the uh, the British uh, the British loss, the Royal Navy loss at the Battle of the Capes. Uh, the uh, the British eventually were forced to surrender on October nineteenth, uh, uh, seventeen eighty one. And the map there you see uh, is a. Uh, image that shows Yorktown kind of in the center and, a, and, and the top of the center there with the American lines surrounding them uh, from, from left to right on the bottom. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. Again, if you have any questions before we uh, start into the period of, uh, of question and answer, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll, we'll get to those very soon. Uh, the British surrendered on October 19th. This was the second major British force to surrender in America between 1777 and 1781. Two large forces um, that, that were lost to the British. Uh, and remember, they're trying to secure America. They're sort of trying to secure the Southern colonies. They're thinking that the Loyalists uh, are, are numerous there, but uh, they were not able to do that. Next slide, please. So was, your, was Yorktown a turning point? Arguably, yes. The British war effort in effect collapsed. Um, now remember, after Saratoga, the war effort did not collapse, but French, the French came and recognized the Americans. Here, the political will of the British government and the logistical and manpower ability to continue the war just did not exist after this surrender uh, became, uh, became well known in uh, London and the rest of England by the end of November. There were no additional major battles fought in this war. Yorktown was, was really it. That showed the British, the Hessians, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Americans, the Loyalists, that, there, that the war was basically not going to be won by the British. Uh, the, it ensured an American victory and independence. Uh, as you see here, these two dates, uh, by March of 1782, uh, several months, five months after Yorktown, the British uh, authorized uh, peace. And Lord North, who was um, uh, the, basically the prime minister for King George III, he resigned in March of 1782, knowing full well that that was going to be it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. 
let's talk a little now that we've seen these five uh, turning points battles and campaigns and uh, the winter at valley forge not every battle is a turning point and if we were to poll historians um or or folks who do a lot of reading which i which i have many of them came up with basically a list of battles uh, but not all of them are decisive and not all of them not all victories are turning points um, all major events in the war created effects but turning points are those that result in significant changes in outcomes so let's look a little bit more into that with the next slide. So I'll use these as examples to show that many of the large battles in the revolution were not turning points. So for example, in Long Island in 1776, the British won, they forced, law, uh, they forced Washington out of New York, they took New York and occupied it for seven more years. What did that gain them? Well, it gained them some temporary logistical support, uh, a, a port to uh, uh, marshal supplies and men out of, but Washington never attacked New York. Uh, he desired to, but never really regarded that. Uh, it, well, it became, a, it, it really was, a, was, a, was a, a location that did not suffer attack and the Americans were able to defeat the British at Saratoga and Guilford Courthouse and Yorktown without uh, attacking New York City. Uh, Brandywine in 1777, uh, that was, remember, that was Howe's attack from the Chesapeake into Philadelphia. Uh, Brandywine, Washington had to retreat from the battlefield. He had to skirt around Philadelphia at the Battle of Germantown, he was not able to force the British out of Philadelphia, which they occupied over the winter and spring and almost into the summer of 1778. However, in 1778, Howe left for London. He was, he was replaced by Clinton and was ordered by Clinton to move back to New York City. So there were two battles, Brandywine and Germantown fought for the capital but it did not change the course of the war. The Battle of Monmouth, which happened just after the withdrawal of the British from Philadelphia, June 28, 1778. This was after Washington's uh, army was improved by uh, uh, French supplies and Baron von Steuben's uh, excellent efforts to make the army into a, a real fighting force. It was a rear guard action and did not prevent the British under Clinton from reaching their objective, uh, New York City. It was a demonstration of the value of Valley Forge, which was the turning point, not Brandywine. Uh, other battles, uh, Savannah was a big victory for the British at the beginning of the Southern uh, Theater's final uh, campaigns, and Charleston, which was on paper an absolute disaster. Thousands of men surrendered to the British, uh, uh, dozens of artillery pieces. They, they lost South Carolina for uh, over a year. But even though British cities fell to the, I'm sorry, colonial cities fell to the British, it did not result in the capture of the South or the, or the reconquest. And the same is true of the British victories that Green was able to uh, um, uh, suffer at Hobkirk's Hill near Camden, Utah Springs between Camden and Charleston. Um, uh, the British successfully uh, lifting the siege of 96 South Carolina. These were indecisive actions. Um, I, would say, I would say possibly the, um, the, the battle that I see often called a turning point the most in books and chapters and uh, research papers and theses and websites has to be cow pens. Everybody likes to study cow pens. It's a fascinating battle. It has a fascinating commander in Tarleton, a fascinating commander in Morgan. Uh, it was a clear cut American victory um, where the Americans 
were able to defeat the British uh, under Tarleton, Tarleton's Legion and some regular army units of the British Redcoats uh, with a do double envelopment. They destroyed Tarleton's command, uh, lost, Tarleton lost almost a thousand of Cornwallis's army. But what was the result? The Americans retreated and Cornwallis continued his uh, campaign into North Carolina. It was not decisive. Um, so that, that, that's my argument on, on Cowpens, that it really is, is uh, overrated as a strategic uh, uh, altering type of battle, whereas, uh, whereas Guilford Courthouse uh, is uh, in, in my estimation. Let's go ahead and start talking about some of the questions we have here. Um, uh, a military historian from the army asks uh, if um, uh, he's read uh, a, a fine, uh, now probably 50 year old study of the British uh, war, for, war in America. Uh, and he wonders if the British would ever have been able to win the war given the extent of the task. Do we, re do we overrate an American agency in victory? Um, so I, I think it's a good point. Um, as, as our, our questioner knows, there was, there's been a, uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago, an excellent book by uh, Andrew O'Shaughnessy called The Men Who Lost America, which is a, which is a wonderfully written and, um, and, and um, a persuasive book on, on the British failing. Um, I, I would boil your question, Dave, down to, and I think, I, I think this is where you're getting, is did the British have enough resources, uh, enough um, wherewithal, both politically, logistically, manpower, to be able to conquer the colonies or to win? I, I would argue that um, after Saratoga, I don't believe they did, um, even though Washington gave up, uh, in, in, in battle, gave up uh, Philadelphia, I, I would really say that that was, uh, that was probably the point after which they would not have done that. Um, and one, one interesting if, uh, diplomatic aspect of this contest was at a certain point, the British were hoping for a negotiated settlement um, and, and getting other European uh, aristocrats or, or politicians from other countries to help negotiate where um, the, the terms of the peace would be you keep what you have. And so they were looking to do that in 1780 and 1781, which uh, explains in part why, why, the, why the British were interested in the South, because they thought that they had a lot of um, they thought that they had a lot of folks in the South that were loyalists, and they would also use that as a base to be closer to uh, the Sugar Islands. So um, thanks for the question. Um, is the movie The Patriot loosely based on the Battle of Cowpens? Well, uh, I would say very loosely. Uh, it also seems to start out as the Battle of Camden and turns into the Battle of Cowpens. Uh, and also, if you if you remember, Francis Marion during the movie turns into Daniel Morgan. So uh, another question on the Champlain Valley Waterway and the British control um, during the French and Indian War and subsequently the Revolution. So um, our our questioner is correct. Uh, it was it was key in both of those conflicts and before that, going back into the French versus colonial. Uh, uh, Indian Wars, French raids on, on the colonial frontier, British retaliation. Uh, that area was fought over uh, in many, many conflicts going back to the 1600s and into uh, the revolution. And, and if, you, if you might know the story where uh, uh, the, when the British uh, took Fort Ticonderoga during the French and Indian War, it was seen as a hu huge position because it, it potentially blocked water access from Champlain all the way down to New York City. Um, the, uh, during the revolution, when the British captured again under Burgoyne, uh, King George III was ecstatic. He thought he had won the war at that point just by taking Ticonderoga. That's how, that's how much it was, um, 
that's how that's how much it was esteemed. Um, all right, uh, what is a Fabian strategy? So that was the strategy I described where you kind of hit at the periphery of your enemy. Uh, you don't engage in a major battle unless you are absolutely certain of victory, which was very questionable for the smaller and, and, and less supplied American forces. And you're basically trying to wear your enemy out and down over the course of months or years. And that came from Fabius, who was a Roman commander uh, in the uh, classical period, who, who, uh, who was really the first example of that kind of uh, strategy. Okay, a friend of mine from South Carolina has asked a very long question, which I hope I can, uh, I can read, but I will do my best. Um, the question is, uh, while discussing Valley Forge, you mentioned Washington's desire to make the Continental Army more European more able to win conventional battles. You persuade me that Washington thought that, but was he right? Can you imagine the colonists defeating the British by fighting as guerrillas and wearing them down in a war of attrition? Absolutely not. They, they would not have been able to do that um, as, as guerrillas. Um, uh, certainly the US Army had a terrible time doing counterinsurgency since World War II is what, uh, what our friend says, uh, definitely true. Um, but I think I, I, Washington did think he, he needed that, that, um, that regular army to be in the field. And was he right? I think he was right. Um, and so you ask, can we imagine the colonists defeating the British by the French fighting as guerrillas? But can we imagine the French coming in on the side of the Americans had they not adopted the need for a European army. Because the battle of Sar the, the campaign of Saratoga was fought by a significant number of American regulars in the field. Um, the, um, the battle of uh, Brandy, uh, excuse me, Monmouth Courthouse, same way. Uh, now granted the French assisted the Americans at Yorktown. There were more French at Yorktown than, than Washington had in his army. They had the experience of the artillery they had the experience of siege warfare. But I would say that, uh, I, I would say the French might not have come into the war at all or just, just with supplies if the uh, Americans had not started to move toward a professional type of army. So thank you for that question. And thanks to uh, all the participants on our call this evening. Please join us again uh, for more programming and please come see us at the museum. Have a good evening.